Well, we have spoken about the journey in Messiah and the process by which we are purified from the wounds of the passions, slowly acquiring the virtues or the likeness of God. This process is, of course, the sanctification of ourselves in the process of salvation or the drawing close to God. So when we say the wounds of the passions, what do we, what do we mean by that? What are the passions? Anger, Anger? okay. That, that, that is one of the passions, yes? Selfishness. Selfishness. Slothfulness. Slothfulness, being laziness, uh, apathy. Um, the passions, the passions are the distortions or the brokenness of, of us that, that each of us has. Uh, and and it, they are a distortion of the virtues. So, for instance, the fathers say that anger is a distortion of a power that we have of passion towards God. Uh, when that is twisted and warped of, of our desire and passion towards God, it becomes anger towards our fellow human beings or God himself. And so this process that we are in is the purification. So today, I pray that I, I'm a little more whole than I was yesterday or five years ago. And that's this process that we are in. When we look back at the pages of our history as a people, the, the Jewish people, the Israel, or even the human race, we see that we are constantly seeking something but never finding it. We strive for something so precious yet so elusive only to find it just out of our reach. Last week, we discussed what it means to possess and to grow in the fear or the awe of God. What do you remember about that process? There, there, were, there were three steps. Do you remember the, what's that? The first step, which is what? Beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Okay, so that is the beginning. And it is, the first step is, is the fear of punishment. Um, we see this played out even in our families. As, as in, when a child is small, you have to have the fear of punishment in order to get them to understand what it is that you want them to do. And likewise, we also have this first stage in our relationship with God. Is that where God wants us to stay? No. No, he doesn't. He wants us to mature, to grow up. So the second stage of this awe or fear of God uh, is a desire for reward. Okay, um, can you think of, of a child as, as when you were a child? Um, and were you promised? Um, I can think of, of one example. Um, if I get A's in school, I got money. Was that bad? No, it was incentive. Well, do you think my parents wanted me to only want the money for getting good grades? No, they wanted to teach me to, that good grades were a goal and they used an incentive. It wasn't wrong. Well, if I spent my whole life simply doing stuff just to get money, then rather than the intention behind that incentive. Okay? So my, that was a, an example. You may have other examples in your personal life of how you re, a reward is, is a motivation. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, um, do you think God wants us simply to only obey him so, because he gives us stuff? No. No, that's, that's stage two. That's, that's, that, there's a stepping stone on our journey. Okay, so what is the third stage out of, out of our, our fear or awe of God? Love. Okay, love. Love of God. All right? So stage one, to, to obey out of fear is to be a slave. Stage two, to only obey because we're going to get something is to be a, a, a hireling. What is a hireling? A what? Hireling. A okay, a servant who only does what he's paid for. Yeah, right. Okay. And then the third stage, uh, the, the highest of that, is the state of being a son or a daughter of God. Uh, and you do what you do, not because you're afraid of being punished or because you want something, but because you love, I love God. That's the place that God wants us to get to eventually. Well, in this journey, we're striving to acquire something that we do not yet fully possess. The one thing that people strive for and rarely possess is true freedom. Think about the struggles in our world today. There are 
struggles to acquire freedom for something. For some, it's a national freedom, um, striving, rising up against a government. Other people, it's rising up in a cause or something. They're striving for freedom. If they were to achieve all those things, would they still be free? Nope. Not without, not without God. Yep. So freedom, genuine freedom, what do you think this is? What does it mean to be free? Okay, free, free, to be free from the distortions of the passions and to be free from death. What else? What is genuine freedom? To have the power to do what you know you should do. Okay, power to do what you know you should do. Yes, yes, definitely, well said. Uh, do you think that freedom... True freedom is to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want? Is, is that freedom? Isn't that how we define freedom? Uh, generally, in, in, our, in our secular society, it's freedom is to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want. That's how the world defines freedom. But is that true? Okay, God's wisdom is not human wisdom. Turn over to the book of uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55 and verse 1. God through the mouth of the prophet says, Behold, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, the sure mercies of David, and indeed I have given him as a witness to the people. A leader and commander for your, for your people, and surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations you do not know shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. He has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have mercy on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, God's definition of things is vastly different than our, our human. The world strives for freedom to be able to do whatever they want, whenever they want. And that's how they define freedom. So think about it. Um, think of the wealthy who have no worries or concerns, right? Because they're wealthy, which isn't true. They can do whatever they want, go wherever they want, buy whatever they want. Do we, do we see genuine happiness? No, we see brokenness. We see slavery because they do not have true freedom. And again, wealth is not wrong. But we see that that's, that, that's not what we strive for, to be wealthy and independent because that is freedom. We see the tattered lives and the shattered families and the destruction that, that, that comes with that. Literally the same, perhaps the opposite end of poverty as well. No, freedom is not found in either ditch. Mm -hmm. So his ways are not the ways of the world, nor are they the process of, of logical or rational thinking of human beings. If this is the case, then God would, would be changeable and fluctuating like his creation. Um, we say, for example, I'll be happy when I get this or that, or I have this or I'm there, or I have, have achieved this standing or this whatever. And we get there and it's nice for a minute, right? But, but does that satisfy us? Nope. And we realize that the carrot has just been moved and we're loping along looking for the next carrot. 
No, God has a constant way. He has that which is and grants us true freedom. So rational, the mind cannot grasp because we say, even us as believers, if I ha- only had this or that, then I will be happy. I will be free. Nope. True freedom is understanding what God wants and how he desires us to think and what he wants us to do. I'll say that again. True freedom is understanding what God wants and how he desires us to think and what he wants us to do. True freedom is found in the law of love toward God and towards our fellow human beings. The royal way, as the apostle calls it. But in order to understand the royal way, we have to be able to discern what that is and, what, and how that is played out, how it is utilized. An example. As we've seen before, as our children grow up, uh, they are brought up in the manners of our homes and in the instructions of what to do and how to communicate. And as they grow into young adults, we no, lo- no longer have to correct everything they do or say because they have learned and grown in the way that is fitting of an adult. For instance, I no longer have to correct them for saying unkind things, for the most part, or telling them to put on clothes, or, or chew with their mouth closed, because they know what's proper. So I don't have to instruct them constantly. I don't have to correct them, because they do it. It's just a part of who they are now. And it's like driving. Uh, you have to start basic, right? And then gradually get more competent in navigating the roads and the challenges that come up with the daily journey. Okay, you, you can teach somebody how to drive. They can read the book, take the test, fail par- parallel parking. <laughs> and you can't prepare them for every single thing that's going to happen out there. Nope. Right? Uh, As the new driver gets more aware of what the laws are for, then they have to evaluate the challenges that are not in the driver's manual. Potholes, broken streetlights, cows on the interstate. Yes, really. (laughs) Debris in your lane and all uh, all the things that no one can prepare you for. But you have to know the principles by which to make wise decisions. Isn't that what we desire for our our children or grandchildren if if you have them? You want them to have the principles by which to make wise decisions. No matter how hard we try, we can't prepare them for everything. Likewise, as believers, we have to learn the principles by which God wants us to navigate. Over and over, our people have been enslaved and fought for freedom. Can you think of examples from the scriptures of the Old Testament? Where where were we um, as as we would say as as the tribes of Israel were in bondage? Where were we? In Egypt. Okay, and we get out of Egypt, and we're free, right? I mean, we were free from the external slavery of Egypt, but we brought the, exter- the internal slavery of Egypt with us, right? Oh, Moses, I'm so hungry. Why did you bring us out here to die? And so the internal slavery is what our people still, and we as human beings, still have to struggle against. Messiah came, and he wanted to bring them freedom. But it wasn't the, fee- the kind of freedom that our Jewish people craved. What were they looking for? Freedom from Rome. Okay, freedom from Rome. Freedom to do whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do. Uh, when you have um, an occupier, you don't have freedom. You have a little bit of freedom to do certain things, but they're telling you where you can go and when you can go and how you can go. And oh, by the way, you have to pay me money to let you go. Uh, and that was the occupying force that in which our people were existing in. But they wanted freedom. Was their desire for freedom from Rome wrong? No, it wasn't. But that's not why Messiah came. He didn't come to set them free from Rome. He set them, come to set them free from something even worse than that. Which was what? Us. Themselves, that's right. We have met the enemy, and it is us. So, what freedom did Messiah offer them? Okay. Eternal life? Um, he said, okay. and what is the truth? Yeah. He says, I am the truth. I am the way. And I am the life. 
So genuine freedom is not freedom to do whatever we want, whenever we want. No, this is bondage to the slavery of the passions. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. And so we have to be placing our minds not on the things of this earth, not in the, the understanding of the philosophies of this earth, but to understand what it means to know what God is desiring. We must be seeking to have a mindset, an ethos, an understanding of what God desires and how he desires us to think and to act. If you turn over to Philippians, please, in the New Covenant. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. The apostle writes and says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Messiah, and if there is any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy of being what? Like-minded. Like and having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Uh, do we see that often? Not really. Not, not, not in any great extent, I suppose. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Well, that just destroyed the entire media uh, that is available to us today. That one statement. What? Humble myself? Oh, no, I'm amazing. Oh, by the way, um, did you, uh, did, are you following my channel? Are you? No, it, it's the puffing up the pride filled that the world seeks. Notice me. Look at me. Want me. Echoing the fallen one's words, worship me, is what Satan says. And he infects us as human beings. He says, continuing that, let each, this is verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. In other words, care about people. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Messiah Yeshua, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God. And why, why was he why was it not, not robbery? Did he consider himself to be equal with God? Because he was equal with God. Um, he was the son of the father. But made himself of no reputation. Okay. When Messiah was here, did he say, look at me, worship me? He never said worship me. He being God. This is, this is Philippians chapter 2. He never said worship me, even though he was deserving of it. He always pointed past himself to the Father. Why do you think he did that? Why, why, would, why, would, why would he do that? Obedience. Okay, obedience, love. Respect. Yeah, he was setting the example. He was saying, you, my brothers and sisters, this is how I want you to be. Don't look to yourselves. Don't look, don't look and accept anything, comp anything, anything compliment, especially when it comes to the things of God, and say, yeah, it's me, I'm pretty awesome. No, Baruch Hashem, okay, receive the glory of God and give it back to him. But wasn't it true also that he hadn't, they hadn't come to the real understanding and knowledge that he was part and parcel of the Father. And until they got that, until they got that understanding, it would mislead them into a more selfish point of view. Perhaps. Continuing in verse 8, it says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore God has also highly exalted him in giving him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. Oh, sorry, on earth and those under the earth. That every tongue should confess that uh, Messiah Yeshua is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And therefore, my brothers and sisters, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but much more in, a, in, in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, why do you think he says you have obeyed what I have told you? It's a little bit harsh, um, Apostle. Why would, why, would, why, would, why would they obey him? I mean, was he just another talking head? Um, spouting off uh, whatever he thought? Why would they have obeyed him? Because he did say often, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And it would give them a sense of knowing who the Father was. 
Yeah. Um, well, this particular is, 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 is the Apostle Paul writing, um, saying, you have obeyed me. Oh. Paul is saying this. Why would they have obeyed him? Okay, because he was our teacher. And so, probably was his history too, how he came to know the Messiah, how much he hated the, the Gentiles and went after them and, and then knew what happened. Yep. Yep. Um, he says, you, You've listened to what I've told you, but I've taught you, because what I have taught you has come from Messiah. Okay. Paul, the apostle, spent time in the company of Messiah, who, who instructed him personally as well as among the other apostles who also physically walked in the presence of God in Messiah and received from him as well. And so he says, and this is a, a passage which many people struggle with, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why would he say that? Because it was a, it was a process. It was minute by minute, day by day. Yep. All the time. I, I say a little louder. Yeah, minute by minute, day by day. Um, you don't stand at the foot of the mountain and say, I've arrived at the top of the mountain. You get your posture up there and you climb it. Okay? And, and what happens when, you, when you're climbing a mountain? You get tired. <laughs> you get tired. Um, you know the, the term backsliding? That's literally what it means, is you slide down the mountain. And it hurts a lot, I can tell you. Just like it does in the spirit. Okay, but it is a process. Okay? Walk out. Work out your salvation. Okay, we don't earn your salvation at all, ever. But you do put into practice what you've learned as a disciple of Messiah. And you climb the holy mountain. So it says, continuing, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure, and do all things without complaining and disputing, ouch, that you may become, what, annoying? And no, Blameless, right? Blameless. Does blameless mean perfect, never making a mistake? No, blameless means you sucked it up, you repented, and you learned from it. Okay, why was Zechariah and Elisheva, Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist, Jochanan, they were called blameless. Does that mean they were perfect? No, that means they were self-aware and found themselves humbling themselves before God, constantly doing teshuva, constantly found in that state of blamelessness, which has to be a daily process, a daily, a, a daily process that we have to. So it says, continuing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Does that describe our generation today? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was back then, and it sure is now. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. Shining as lights means we're different than and we manifest something different than the world. Holding fast the word of life so that you may rejoice in the day of Messiah that I have not run in, la in vain or labored in vain. And yes, I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the, sa on the sacrifice and service of your faith, referencing one of the temple sacrifices uh, of, of the drink offering. And I'm glad to rejoice with you all. For this same reason, you should also, you also um, be glad and rejoice with me. Okay, so he's saying that we have to be different. We have to be thinking different and becoming different. So in truth, there really is only one freedom. And it's the holy freedom of Messiah, whereby he freed us from sin and from evil and from the devil. And it binds us to God. For all other freedoms are illusory, false, and that is to say, they are slavery. Okay, so I want you to think. Um, an unbeliever is given a million dollars. What do you think that person is probably going to do with it? Okay, spend it? Go crazy with it? Um, it will probably destroy them. If not a million, well, let's, let's just say five million, because who can, we can spend a million pretty, pretty fast, right? Five million. Everybody wants a piece of you. Um, and suddenly your, your simple life you thought was freedom now because you have all this wealth and now you find yourself with no peace because 
you don't even know who to trust anymore because you don't even know if people genuinely like you or if they just want something that you have. Is that freedom? No, that would be slavery. The more things you have, the more you have to work to keep those things, to maintain them, to possess them. Yeah. Why would you take them from you? Yeah. So much work and effort involved. Yeah. Yep. That also leads to more, more than swamp, too. Yep. Um, we always want the bigger carrot, no. the better carrot, the new and improved carrot. So truly, these are slaveries. Psalm uh, 119. Psalm 119. And verse 45. Psalm 119, 45. Okay, I'm actually going to back up to 43. And not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty or freedom, for I seek your what? Precepts. Okay, principles. Um, the understanding of what to do. Okay, remember the, the example of learning how to drive? Um, you, can, you can have a, a book, you can watch videos, you can drive and have the experience of driving, but there's some things that you can't be prepared for. Um, they can't fit everything that could possibly happen into that video. You have to learn principles of how to approach whatever comes towards you. Okay? Um, person cuts in front of you. Does, is there a place in the manual where it says, don't be angry at that person? Right? Um, no. You, ha you, you, I respond based upon the principles we've learned. And, and, and things that perhaps come out of our mouths sometimes. Um, is that always godly? No. no. We have to apply the principles of God to our everyday circumstances and situations. Okay. Everything that is, could happen, all the situations are not found, but are understood through how one ap ap approaches them. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Okay, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22. It says, But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Messiah. Yeshua might be given to those who believe. But before faith, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which afterwards would be revealed. Okay? What was the purpose of the Torah? What's that? Okay. To keep us, to, to guard us. It, uh, the apostle uses the word pedagogue. Um, a pedagogue was um, a, 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 a teacher of a child. Okay, a bodyguard, um, a nanny, if you will, who also knows karate. Okay? <laughs> so that was the purpose of the, of the Torah, was to grow up Israel and guard them until they would grow up. Okay, and when Israel grew up, then, then what did God do? He sent Messiah who, who would prepare the people for the Spirit of God, which would enable all who would receive Messiah, Jew and Gentile, to receive the Spirit of God, which would enable them to do what God wanted to. Okay, that was the purpose. Okay, my children have freedom within the boundaries that I have provided for them. Okay, do, we, do we all need boundaries? We sure do. Um, True freedom is not doing whatever you want, whenever you want it. Okay, you're an adult now, and nobody tells you what to do. Do you do whatever you want to do? No, you don't, because you've learned certain things, even within a secular society, of you don't do that. Okay? Um, you don't go to your neighbor's house and throw eggs at it. Not that anybody would ever do that, of course. Why don't you do that? 
because there's, there, there's a repercussion that would happen. Um, they might come and throw eggs at your house, or they'd call the police. Okay, but you have the freedom to do that, right? Yeah? Do, we, do you have the freedom to do that? Okay? But you choose not to because you understand there's a consequence. Okay? You have freedom within boundaries. And so this is the understanding of what are the boundaries that God desires for us. Our boundaries are different than the world's. Sometimes the world doesn't even have any boundaries, especially not up here. But God says to you and to me, I want you to have boundaries. I want you to think on holy things. Sadly, we all struggle against that. But he gives us boundaries in which he desires. There is freedom within boundaries. Okay? The Torah, the commandments of Messiah were the boundaries by which freedom was experienced. Okay? And slavery was not a part of it. Over a couple of chapters to chapter 5, Galatians 5. Galatians 5 and verse 13. Again, the Apostle Paul writing, For you, brothers and sisters, have been called to liberty, freedom, not only to use liberty as an opportunity, or do not use liberty, rather, as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. But I say then, Walk in the Spirit, as you have, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the law are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentiousness, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Those who are led by the Spirit are, are not under the law. Okay? Well, define or tell me how that statement makes sense. Those who are led by the Spirit are not under the law. Yes. So you're not because, because we grew up. Right. Right. Okay? So and it is basically saying we're not under the penalty of the law because we don't do those things that the law says don't do. Okay? If the law says don't stomp on someone's foot, we don't stomp on someone's foot. Therefore, I'm not under the penalty of that which is somebody punching me. Okay? So if he says do not steal then I'm not under the penalty of that because I just don't steal. Therefore, I have freedom. And what is my freedom? Not being in jail? The love of God? I'm not guilty of anything. And I'm saying this metaphorically and hypothetically because I am guilty of a lot of things. But I'm not under the burden of my conscience telling me, why did you steal? Why did you lie, I'm not under that burden because I didn't do it. And that is freedom. I'm not under the burden of the guilt that comes from sin in that moment. And I'm free and at peace. But give me five minutes and I'm going to step on a landmine again because that's who I am. God have mercy on me, a sinner. And I do teshuva and return to God again and again and again each day. But in the, in the spaces of time when I have not committed a sin, I am experiencing the freedom of Messiah. Does that make sense? That's what it means to be free. And not under the law is that we're not under the penalty of it, which ultimately is death. Okay, but there were, there were various penalties of breaking the Torah, which was... If I killed my neighbor's goat, I had to like, give him three goats back. That was the recompense for which. 
but if I don't kill his goat, I'm not guilty. But now God says, I don't even want you to think about killing your neighbor's goat or slashing his tires. Because thought leads to action. And that's why the apostle says, take every thought captive. Because if you or I don't, we will eventually act out whatever it is that is within the heart. And that's why the cleansing of the heart has to be a, a daily process. Um, if you only clean out the dish that you eat, soup and cereal, and if you, if, if you don't ever wash it and you just keep putting food back into it, um, yum. Uh, what happens to you eventually? You're going to get sick because there is stuff there and, and more stuff and, and, you're, and we're scraping the stuff and eventually it, it's going to make us sick. That's how we have to cleanse the heart. We have to be washing the heart. How often do you want to wash that dish? You, you want to skip a couple days and yeah, I'll get around to it? Every time you use it. Every day. Likewise, the heart has to be cleansed daily. Romans 6, 22. Romans 6, 22. But now, Romans 6, 22, but now after having been set free from sin and having become slaves or servants of God, you have your fruit to holiness and to end and to this end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Okay, he says, you've been, you've been, it's like when we come to God, we're, we're like slaves, right? Servants of God, because we fear punishment. Okay, when, if, if you work for somebody, and, and many of us do, uh, so you work for your employer, can you do whatever you want, whenever you want? No, you have boundaries, perhaps you have Rules that are in a book, perhaps? Do you have freedom to break those rules? Yep. You have the freedom to do it. But if you do, there's probably going to be a consequence, like fired. Um, so we have to be those that understand that the freedom, the choice is there, but what is the best and the wisest choice? We see that this is that we have become servants of God and, and we're in this journey. And you have your fruit to what? What, is, what does it say? You have your fruit to holiness. And to that end, everlasting life. What is holiness? Okay. What is holiness? What does it mean for you and I to be holy? Separate unto God, okay. What else? The likeness of God. The likeness of God? Like acting like him? Um, treating people like him? Um, and we're going to do it imperfectly. And when we do it imperfectly, what should we do? To another, to another person. Apologize. Apologize. Forgive me. I, 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 that's not who I am. And I, I, I apologize for what I did or I said. Okay. What if we went to God on the 375 millionth time to ask for forgiveness and he said, nope. How do you think you would feel at that moment when the creator of the universe said, no, I'm not going to forgive you? Oh. I mean, what do we have if we don't have a relationship with God for forgiveness? He's growing us up. He's, 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 he's making us become something different day by day, and he forgives us so freely. So living in freedom means that we have the mindset of Messiah, which does not think and act like the world, but shows forth the characteristics and the virtues of God. Love, joy, peace, patience. I also like long-suffering as a translation of patience. Some people, by the word freedom, understand the ability to do whatever one wants to do. People who have the more allowed, who have more, have allowed themselves to come into slavery to sins, passions, and defilements, much more than others who appear as zealots of eternal freedom, sorry, external freedom, wanting to broaden the laws as much as possible. But such a man uses external freedom only to severely burden himself with inner slavery. 
True freedom is the active ability of a man who is not enslaved to sin, who is not pricked by a condemning conscience, to choose the better in light of God's truth, and to bring it into actuality with the help and the gracious power of God. This is the freedom of which neither heaven nor earth can restrict. So, then this, this process is really simple, right? To acquire this mindset of thinking and treating, treating each other right. This is really easy, right? Yeah? We try. Why is it hard to have this mindset or this ethos? Okay. Contrary to our flesh, contrary to who we are. What else? What else? Anybody ever? Okay. Um, let me an example. Knowing you should do something, but choosing not to, and doing doing what you want to do. Okay. If we've been wronged by someone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone's hurt you. What do you know you should do? Forgive. Forgive them. Why is that so hard? Because we're right. Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm right. I mean, I, why should I forgive them? Self-justification. Okay, self-justification. There's a whole host of reasons. There's, there's not one right answer. Uh, there, there's a lot of reasons. But God didn't say, only forgive if. He says, forgive so this mindset, this ethos of understanding the principles by which God desires, how do we acquire that? Okay, repetition. Remembering the cross and his forgiveness. Even when they were nailing him to the cross, his last words were forgive. And to try to live a life that is at least going towards that standard. Mm-hmm. Amen. Separation and it, it, I'm like to find that. The thing that's causing you to sin okay. or to be angry, you separate yourself from that environment. Okay, so removing ourselves from it, the environment that causes us or evokes us to sin, yes? Humbling ourselves and asking God to have mercy on us and help us to resist these things to yield to Him. Okay, yep. So, I mean, the Bible is, 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 is good to read, yes? Is it easy to read? No? Um, it, is, it, is it simple to read? No. no. No, it's not. If it was simple, then why are there so many interpretations and beliefs that contradict each other? And why are there 40,000 denominations and more being formed every day if it's so easy? and so simple. We must look back to the apostles and their disciples, the fathers, to be able again to acquire the mindset of Messiah. Why would I say this? Because they're the ones that walked with him. They're the ones that were taught by him. Okay. They're the ones that knew and taught their disciples and passed down a legacy uh, and a, a foundation that was laid out by Messiah himself. Okay, so they, they walked with Messiah, they experienced him, and they, they learned from him. Good. To that advanced point, there was a lot more taught that wasn't written down. Truly. We can't find it in the scriptures. Truly. Okay. So. But once they give explanation to the hard parts of scripture, because the, what they, what had been passed down from Christ to the disciples to So we're, we're talking about a standard by which was taught and has been maintained 
and that we can draw upon. Um, what is one of the, the biggest uh, um, accusations against um, the leader of the Church of Rome? What, what, is, what was stated that most people have a problem with? He says, I have the authority to interpret I, not we, as, as we see in the scriptures. I have the ability to interpret and read, and, and, and what I say is how it is. But I tell you, every person who thinks that way and says, I have the ability, has placed themselves in the same place as the Bishop of Rome, in error. Because if I... I have the ability, and you have the ability, and, we, and, there, and there's difference there, that's a problem. Because it's not simple. Does that make sense? And so therefore, if there has to be a standard by which, then it behooves us to understand what that is. Proverbs chapter 3. Okay, the apostles, as you're turning there, Proverbs chapter 3. The apostles are the ones that Messiah entrusted with teaching and growing the people of God, Jews and Gentiles, because they acquire the mindset and the ethos of Messiah. They also show us how to acquire it. The prophet King Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 3, my son, and you can put in daughter because he's talking to you too, do not forget my law, but let, my heart, let your heart keep my commandments. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think as, as a father, what are some things that I might teach my children? Respect. Okay, respect. Um, to look for those that nobody wants to be around, that nobody cares about, and, and seek them out and take care of them. I mean, that could be something that I teach my children. Okay, don't forget my commands, I say to my children. Look for the one who is neglected, is an example perhaps. For length of days and long life and peace will they add to you. And let not mercy and truth forsake you. And bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. And also find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Okay, many of you, and you've told me this, I've, I've had these conversations with you. You say, I don't know why I'm so successful or good at what I do. Because I haven't received this in a natural way. It's God has blessed these hands, and it's God who has blessed this mind to be able to do and think. I don't know why I've been successful. Okay, because you were, you were given principles by which, from wherever you came from, as well as your parents. And the gift of God is he's blessed the work of your hands because you're seeking him, like a, striking a, a tuning fork, and, and you're harmonizing your heart to God, and you've been doing this for many years now. And this is why, and it says that you'll find favor. I found favor in many times in my life, and I don't understand why, because I'm not that smart. Okay, I'm not that good at what I do, but God blesses me and blesses the works of my hands. And I cannot ever say, yeah, I did that because I know better. I give glory to God because there's no way I could accomplish that. That's God's grace, his energy, his power to accomplish his will in me and you. He says, continuing in verse 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and what? Do not lean on your understanding. So I want you to imagine this. Well, I'll just give you a, a pointing example. We have a table in the other room that has um, a little glitch in it. And if you sit on that table... What, what do you think that's going to happen to you? It's going to fall on your posterior, right? Why? Because you trusted this thing, and it, it wasn't there. It, it isn't going to hold you up. Likewise, our trust of ourselves, we will fail. God says, trust in me. Trust in me. He says, lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Now here we are back again. Fear the Lord and what? Turn away from evil. Depart from evil. Well, why would I, why would I want to fear God 
Oh, because he says, don't touch this, don't look at this, don't say this, don't be this. Okay. I begin my journey, and I think if we're all honest, we're probably all three of those, slave, hireling, and child of God, multiple times a day. But he's wanting us to grow up and to be consistent, and this is the process, percussion, that we are in. He says that fear the Lord and depart from evil, and it will be what? Health to your what? Health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Okay, what happens if, if, if they're your, your bones? They look good, sound good, they're really hard, but what happens if, if there's something that's inside those bones isn't healthy? What is it called? Inside the bone? Marrow. Okay. When the, when the prophet King David wanted to, to, to say something super important, he would say that it was deep in the marrow. Because what is the purpose of the marrow? A little bit louder. Okay, are those important? Life is in the blood. The apostle, and then backwards toward the prophets, he would say, let the marrow of who you are be filled with life because life is in the blood. And it's not just our blood, but it's the blood of the Lamb who has delivered us from all evil. Um, if you were rescued from a concentration camp and taken back to normal society, where you had freedom, what would you have to fight against probably the rest of your life? Fear of losing your freedom. You, I, would, would, be, would have a fear and a slavery to something that is, is still in the past, but we have it with us today. And God wants each of us to be set free from those fears which are not honoring him. And whatever that is for you or for me, may we lay those things down at his feet. And let us seek the understanding that God desires that were found in the holy apostles and their disciples so that we may reap the benefit of 2,000 years of experience and thereby acquire true freedom found in possessing the mind of Messiah. It doesn't come overnight. Um, if you were to be taken to Korea, um, or you go to Korea, you don't understand how Koreans think. You might like some of their food, but you don't understand how they think. And likewise, all of us, Jews and Gentiles, coming to God, we have to acquire the mindset and how to, to understand what God desires. And this is the process. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask that you would continue to guide us, lead us, direct us. Lord, form us in the likeness of your Son. And may you cause each of us to rise to the stature of the fullness of what it means to be a child of God, reflecting our Holy King. Father, for the children reflect the parents. And Father, may we reflect you as our Holy Father. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen.